along that line and this is the Planck's distance so everything lined up nicely and then I looked at the biological entity and found that uh, microtubules which are little um, structures that makes up your cells boundary okay oscillate at 10 to the 11 to 10 to 14 Hertz and when you plot their size it almost bisects perfectly this you know continuous line from universal size the size of the universe to billions of times smaller than an atom everything lined up including biology which is you you are in that mechanism you are part of this conduit of information of the vacuum that goes from infinitely big to infinitely small through you and as it passes through you it picks up your specific interpretation of the universe and feeds it to the infinity of all things so that your participation is counted Do you start to get a sense of your responsibility? And so, there, you know, we start to feel that connection to all of the scales. But how do we get that feeling of that connection? Just a little side note on philosophy. We get that feeling of connection not by trying to connect with infinitely big, people say, I can't visualize that. Well, that's because your senses are fairly limited. But you have the infinitely small within you. So through that direction, you can connect to infinity. This is why most of the masters that have walked the earth have said, go within. The kingdom of heaven is within, you know, the Buddha is within everything, the Bindu point is within everything. And it's your connection to all knowledge. Right? Right. <laughs> oh. You're all going, oh man, you mean I've got to sit in like some pretzel you know, pretzel position every morning and like, oh, no pretzel necessary. You can do this sitting down anywhere or standing up if you want to. You have access to senses towards the infinitely small because you contain it. But, you know, when I wrote these equations, there was an issue. One of it was like, okay, if everything is different scales black holes, when I presented that to physicists, I got my butt kicked pretty hard. Typically kicked out of physics conference. <laughs> um, why? Because you know, I've got an atom in there that I'm saying is a black hole. Is the atom really a black hole? And that brings us to that paper I just published that's so controversial. And I assure you, I'm still dodging plenty of tomatoes and rotten eggs. <laughs> right? That paper is called a Schwarzschild proton and it's kind of a bombshell in very simple mechanical equations that I'm going to show you right now I prove that the atom is a mini black hole and how did I do that? well I looked at it this way I said I'm not going to do like everybody else and ignore the density of the vacuum Okay? I'm not going to ignore the most intense, the most energetic, probably the source of everything, uh, thing that we found in physics. So, I said, 
inside the proton volume, right, the proton is like, let's say you have a simple hydrogen atom, you have a little proton, is the nucleus of the atom, it's very, very, very tiny in the middle. I said, inside there, how much volume is there? And so I calculated the volume of a proton, it's 10 to minus 39, depending on which radius you take, it's an approximation, 10 to the minus 39 centimeter cube. And I said, how much of this energy that's in the vacuum is still present inside the teeny weeny beady proton? And I made the calculation, which is pretty straightforward. And the result is 10 to the 55th grams within a proton volume. There's still 10 to the 55th grams inside the volume of a proton. Where did we see that number? The mass of the universe. The mass of the universe. Now remember our assumption, remember our statement, the vacuum connects all things. If that was true, that would mean that you'd expect all the information of every proton in our universe to be present in each one of them. And that's exactly how the math came out. Isn't that cool? This is actually the mathematical evidence I'll call it for now, that everything is one. All right? Now, no longer just a concept, no longer a dogma. Now, it's a mathematical, physical evidence. Like that? Yeah, right on. <laughs> I thought that was cool. I didn't mention it in that paper. I didn't talk about oneness, you know. <laughs> One, don't want to be too obvious in those papers. I said, oh, you know, this number is evidence that all protons are entangled. Right? <laughs> you know? If you use physics terms, then they'll listen. And so, this is all nice, you know, this uh, 10 to the 55th gram per proton volume. Remember, 10 to the 55th gram is enough to make the whole universe a black hole. So obviously, if I take all of that as the mass of the, unit of the proton, no doubt the atom is a black hole. But actually, how much of that do I need to take? Very little. In fact, if I only use 10 to the minus 39 percent, a very teeny, weeny, beady, little amount of 10 to the 55th grams of energy, the proton becomes a black hole. The atom is a black hole. And so in this paper, in some ways, you could say that I'm saying that the vacuum is feeding all atoms. That the material world is basically 10 to the minus 39% of the energy of the vacuum. It's just a little beady weedy leak, teeny weeny leak of the vacuum. And it makes up the material world. You all followed this? So imagine if we tap this energy that's in space everywhere, we don't even need to tap anywhere close to 10 to the minus 39% of it. You know, if we tap just, if we cohere that energy, get it to work with us just a little bit, just a teeny weeny bit, we produce enough power to power our whole planet for thousands and thousands of years. We can produce enough power to create gravitational fields, gravitational drives, travel across our solar system, travel across our galaxy 
probably go from one galaxy to another or even one universe to another. We free our society from the bounds of being stuck to the surface of a planet, which is not a really good place to be. Just isn't. Cosmologically speaking, surfaces of planets are highly unstable. They don't just hang out because there's people on it. <laughs> Our atmosphere is equivalent to like if you took a billiard ball and put a little shellac on it. That's about the thickness of our atmosphere. And the, and the, the earth beside the sun is a, like a little grain of sand. A teeny weeny grain of sand. And one of those big sun flare comes out in the right place at the right time and <laughs> and everybody in the solar system goes, huh, what was that? Oh, that was Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> All done. Next thing you know, it looks like Mars. Right? So, never mind, you know, asteroids and comets and all the rest of the stuff. Right? So there is a typically a cosmological time period in which a civilization like ours has to figure out how to get off their rock. And if they don't on time, well, you know, on to the next round. You see what I'm saying? This is a fundamental step that a civilization must do and we are at that point. We are at that moment in our evolution where we must understand these more fundamental principles of the physics of the universe that includes the philosophy of the universe, the spirituality of the universe, the connection that connects us all and understand how it works and apply it in our technology so that we can actually, literally ascend. So, after all this rant, <laughs> um, if I use 10 to the third, to the minus 39 percent the mass of the, uh, of the mass of the vacuum, to make the atom an any black hole, all of a sudden my atom is a heck of a lot heavier than the atom that's measured in laboratory. So the mainstream is really not happy with that. <laughs> you can imagine. In fact, my atom is 10 to the 39 orders of magnitude larger than the standard proton. So you know, you would think, oh my God, it's got to be wrong, right? 10 to the 39 orders of magnitude wrong, <laughs> right? Well, the first thing I did, I said, well, if I'm that wrong, this, you know, it shouldn't work in a scale. So I took a, a scaling law. This time I took the mass against the radius, and I put all the objects in the universe I could find, you know, universe, this is the Planck's mass, the Planck's distance, and then, you know, galaxies, quasars, the sun, the earth, pulsars, and this is the Schwarzschild proton, this is the black hole proton, and this is the standard model proton. So, you know, this is straight off data. This is not really debatable. Obviously, this data point is in the wrong place. Why is that? It's because our way of measuring the mass of the proton, and just so you know, in physics, mass has not been defined. They don't tell you where it comes from. Right? Uh, is to knock the proton out by shooting particles at it. And then it pops out of the atom, and then we make a measurement, and we, and we assume that the proton was the same mass when it was in there. <laughs> well... You know, when you've disturbed a system, 
you probably don't get the right data. It's the same thing in